Well, good morning, Walden Church. Last week, we began a very chilling challenge to look at the words of Christ that were the most difficult. Now, why would we do that? I mean, isn't it better to have lessons and sermons about things we agree with? That way we can feel good about ourselves when we leave the church. Yeah, I don't know that when people listen to Jesus, they always left feeling good. In fact, in John 6, it says, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, this is hard saying. Who can listen to it? And then if you go further down the page to verse 66, it says, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Now, some of his disciples left him. The Bible says many, right? So when Jesus walked this earth, he gave us something like 40 commandments, not suggestions, commands. And admittedly, 40 is a lot. It's a lot to remember. It's a lot to obey. But Peter says it best. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We're looking at the difficult teachings of Jesus because we have to. We have no choice. If we don't challenge ourselves, we will never grow. So today, we're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount. This is big, Jesus' uh, biggest, longest recorded sermon. If you ever want to find it easily, it's Matthew 5. And perhaps you'd be thinking, oh, well, I like the Sermon on the Mount. I, I agree with that teaching. Today is going to be easy. Think again. <laughs> This morning might be the most difficult of all. Even Khrushchev, right? Khrushchev, the former president of the Soviet Union, he was also an atheist, he agreed with the Sermon on the Mount. Even in Russia, they're against murder and adultery and divorce. None of those things benefit society. But Khrushchev said, I only disagree on one point. And that was when Christ said, If I am struck on the cheek, I will turn the other. And he said, I believe in another principle. If I am hit on the left cheek, I hit back on the right cheek so strongly that their head might fall off. Let's see what Jesus said. He said, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Difficult teaching number two, don't retaliate. Khrushchev didn't think it would work. And you know what? Most of us don't either. Think about how counterculture that statement is. Don't retaliate. It literally goes against everything the world teaches. I mean, or or forget the world, (laughs) right? Try telling a Texan not to retaliate you might as well be speaking a foreign language. The Jews have done enormous research to show that their rabbis throughout the centuries have come up with very similar ideas to Jesus. But they can't find anything in those old rabbinical teachings that come close to saying, love your enemy. The religious leaders of the world can quote all their wise men and holy men to show that they also have similar religious values as the Sermon on the Mount, but they have nothing that matches Christ's teaching to love your enemies. After all, enemies, right, by the very definition, are not to be loved. You simply cannot love an enemy. If you did, they wouldn't be an enemy. Maybe that was Jesus' point. Eli Stanley Jones was an American Methodist Christian missionary. He was a theologian, an author. He's remembered for his uh, interreligious lectures to the people of India. His most famous book was called The Christ of the Indian Road. Sold more than a million copies worldwide uh, in 1925. And this is what he writes in his book about turning the other cheek. When I come to the following verse, I breathe a little faster, for we now have reached the very crux of the whole Sermon on the Mount, this refusal to retaliate, the turning of the other cheek, and the loving 
of one's enemies are the center of the whole. If the principle is not workable, then the heart of the sermon does not beat. It is a carcass, a dead body of doctrine. But if it is workable, then its heart does beat, and in beating it pumps its warm lifeblood into every portion of the Christian soul. It is hard to believe that these handful of verses can be of such great significance, but the evidence is very strong that they represent the only hope for us to escape self-destruction. As of this month, the Federation of American Scientists estimate that there are over 12,000 nuclear warheads in the world. About 10,000 10, of them are in military stockpiles, another 4,000 are deployed. In the United States and Russia, we possess 90% of them. It's shocking to think that there are enough nuclear weapons in countries to destroy the entire world many times over. I want to tell you a story, real story, but not about the US or Russia, another place called Nineveh. The story of Nineveh takes place in the book of Jonah. And it's ironic that when we hear Jonah, we think about the whale story, but that is not what the book is about. Not at all. In fact, the whale is mentioned twice in the entire book. There's one sentence that says the whale swallowed him, and then there's a second sentence that says the whale spat him back out. So what is the book about? Well, Nineveh was where modern day Iraq is. And back in Jonah's day, they were horrible, horrible people. And so the book of uh, Jonah is about retaliation and it's about loving your enemies. One example of how bad the Ninevites were, uh, they used to remove the noses and ears of their prisoners so they were marked for life. And just like other civilizations in ancient Mesopotamia, their culture was immoral, terrifying. They encouraged temple prostitution, child sacrifice, abortion, and the killing of infants. Jonah 1.1 begins. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. And Jonah hears these words from the Lord, and he runs away. All God says is, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to be a prophet. You are a prophet. Go to Nineveh, be a prophet. Tell them they're evil. Tell them that they have offended me. And Jonah is thinking to himself, no way. I like my nose. I like my ears. Jonah is swallowed by a big fish. Jonah repents. And God repeats his command. Go to Nineveh and tell them that they offend me. So Jonah walks three days into town and he begins to prophesy. In chapter three, it says, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne, removing his robe, covering himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn away from his evil and from violence that was in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. The eye gougers believe the message. Their hearts change. They also repent and they begin to fast and pray in the hopes that God will change his mind. And it worked. God spared their city. And this made Jonah mad. He shook his fist to God and said, I knew it, I knew it. This is why I didn't want to come. You, you always do this. You forgive, you show grace, you're a loving God. But these people don't deserve forgiveness. And Jonah walks off and sits under a tree and crosses his arms. 
Several decades ago, there was a conference in England on comparative religions. Experts from around the world debated, if any, that there was a unique, solely o only belief that was only, right? Just unique to the Christian faith. In other words, side by side with other religions, what does Jesus teach that nobody else teaches? The debate was going on for some time, and C.S. Lewis wandered into the room. He said, what is all this rumpus about? And someone told him what they were discussing, and Lewis said, oh, that's easy. It's grace. The Buddhist Eightfold Path, the Hindu Doctrine of Karma, the Jewish Covenant, the Muslim Code of Law, each one of them is a process to earn forgiveness. Only Christianity dares to make God's love unconditional, free of charge, no strings attached. And this is where the even bigger difficult command of Jesus comes in, more encompassing than just do not retaliate. Command number three, Jesus says, love your enemies. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Jesus is the only religious leader, only one, who ever taught, love your enemy. And I can tell you why. Because if someone gives us a black eye, they deserve to find out what it feels like so they won't do it again. In fact, I'm going to feel bad that they only have one black eye because then their face looks lopsided. So I'm going to give them two just to balance it out. And this is why we're taught not to retaliate. It doesn't work for one. And second, we rarely, equally, fairly retaliate. We always escalate it. You know, last week we talked about Samson, and I didn't tell you my favorite Samson story. And it's a story of retaliation. See, before Delilah, Samson was married. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but his wife had two major problems. Uh, number one, she was a Philistine. <laughs> so she was an enemy, right? And the, that really led to the second one. She didn't love him. So one day Samson comes home from work, and she's not there. She had returned to her homeland, and she had married Samson's best friend. So how does Samson take revenge? He gathers up 300 foxes, the animal, foxes, ties them together in pairs, lights them on fire, and sets them loose in the Philistine crops. Those flaming foxes burned all the crops they had harvested, plus all the crops that they were going to harvest, plus their olive fields. Retaliation never makes things better. It's only when we obey Jesus. It's only when we love our enemies. It's only when we turn the other cheek and go the second mile and pray, Father, forgive them. Only then do we start to break the cycle of violence. 1 Corinthians 16 says, let all that you do be done in love. Only love has the power to turn an enemy into a friend. Retaliation will not change a person. Hatred will not change a person. Arguing and fighting and name calling will not change a person. Only love can change a person from the inside out. In the spring of 1985, Jerry Levin, who was CNN's chief in the Middle East was released by his Muslim captors. He had been among the first Americans taken hostage and he was held for a year. And here's what he said to a magazine about his time there. He said, while in captivity, I had what some may call a spiritual awakening. Others might call it being born again or what others simply might call coming to my senses. Up to that time I was taken hostage, I had been an atheist. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, very unforgiving, revenge oriented Jewish American atheist. But in my lonely isolation, I began to talk to myself. And I thought, if I keep this up, I'm going to go crazy. Suddenly, I began to consider the fact that people for thousands of years have been talking to this thing called God. And they hadn't gone crazy. Even more than the idea of God, I had always scorned the idea of Jesus. 
His prescriptions for achieving peace on earth had been sure were unworkable. Forgiveness, in particular, was an impractical act that only served to leave the, the foreigner dangerously vulnerable. However, the more I thought about forgiveness and also Jesus' idea of love and reconciliation, the more I realized how exactly appropriate they have been and are for creating the only climate in which true tranquility, true peace, and true justice can universally exist. Killing and fighting only perpetuate resentment and hostility and promote vendetta, retaliation, and revenge. In the 20th century, our century, more people have come, vic become victims of war and tyranny than in any other era, and it became clear to me that the absence of Jesus' teachings has been the root of the world's most critical continuing problems. Wow! I gotta say that again, right? The absence of Jesus' teachings has been the root of the world's most critical continuing problems. Right now there are two shows on TV. One of them is The Chosen, and it's in its third season. I believe the second one is over on Peacock, and it's called Those About to Die. One show is all about Jesus, and the other one is depicting the underbelly of Rome. The show about Rome is showing you how corrupt, how self-centered, how perverse Rome was. But Rome didn't stay that way. In fact, we know that in 313, Emperor Constantine issued the Edict of Milan, which made Christianity the religion of the state. So what changed? Was it because the Jewish zealots were able to combat Rome blood for blood? No. It was actually during the Antonine Plague of the second century and the Cyprian Plague. The Christians in Rome cared for the sick and the dying when everyone else fled. One third of Rome died. 5,000 people a day. So it was the Christians who did not flee the cities, but who stayed to nurse their families back to health and took care of Roman families who had been abandoned. Their actions, which included providing food and drink, burying the dead, and caring for both Christians and Romans, saved many lives, and it demonstrated Christian love. Some historians believe that these acts of mercy helped Christianity spread during the first four centuries of its existence. You see, early Christians believed that God was merciful, and that they should love one another, and they showed this by caring for others even during a plague. How do we love our enemies? Let's look back at Jesus and see what he says. Luke 6, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. That's your three-point sermon right there, right? Number one, do good to those who hate you. That's what he says. Romans 12, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do good to those who hate you. Did you ever wonder what that meant? It's, it's more of a confusing passage of Jesus than a difficult passage. What does it mean to heap burning coals on someone's head? One thought is that to heap burning coals on the head means to stop the argument by fulfilling whatever the need is. For example, if your friend yell, is yelling at you because you won't let him eat something from your lunch, <laughs> you can offer him the item that they're asking for, plus give them a second item. That will fulfill their need, but it also stops their anger and it perhaps um, pushes them even to the point where they start to recognize their own attitude and the meanness that was in their heart because 
now the act that you have done is a stark contrast to their attitude. Another thought is that to heap burning coals on the head refers to a time when people had to actually keep their home fire alive as a necessity during the winter time. So if someone couldn't keep their home fire going, they would walk around the town carrying some sort of bucket on their head, asking for coals to rekindle. So putting coals in this container would be a blessing. Either way, Jesus is saying, pay back kindness to your enemies instead of trying to hurt them. Do not allow their mean or their sinful actions to control you. Instead, make the decision that you're gonna choose love as your response. Don't try to get even or get back at them, rather overwhelm them with kindness. He says, do not be overcome by evil, overcome evil with good. Obeying Jesus says that your kindness will destroy the enemy's cruelty. The next thing Jesus says is, bless those who curse you. You know, we Christians, we can act pretty good, but it's how we react in a given situation that shows how much of a Christian we are, how much we listen. Because when cursed, most of us don't act well. We often respond like the world. We'll fight fire with fire. But Jesus says, we're supposed to fight fire with blessing. And then last, he says, pray for those who abuse you. What's the greatest example of this? Jesus on the cross. Looks down at Roman soldiers and Jewish Pharisees and says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. As I consider our calling to love and to live God's way, no matter how the world treats us, I am reminded of the prayer that is most often attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. It says, Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us show love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we seek. Who are the enemies that God is calling you to love? Do good to them. Bless them. Pray for them. Show them the love that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray. Lord, this is perhaps the most difficult of all your commands. To love our neighbor as ourself. To love our neighbor the same way we love our enemy. To love our enemy to the point that we have no more enemies. To not retaliate, to turn the other cheek, to walk the second mile, to heap kindness on those who would insult us and curse us, and to be a blessing to the world. Lord, we are not called to be like the world or to be like our neighbor. May those who see us as Christians see us as different. May they see our calling as different. May they see our church as different. May they see our words and actions as different because we are set apart, because we are passionate, because we are loving, because we are filled with grace. May no hate come from our lips. May no revenge come from our actions. May we walk in the footsteps of Jesus all the days of our life. Amen. Hey, well, thanks for coming out and watching this with us today. And I would invite you to come on Sunday. We have two services every Sunday, one at 930, and that is our traditional service. We have a choir, we're gonna sing hymns, we're gonna say responsive readings, we're gonna read the Lord's Prayer, we're gonna have communion. It's gonna feel exactly like the church that you grew up in. We also have a service at 11, and that is our contemporary service. We have a worship team and we have a full children's program from nursery all the way through high school. And we would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.